Hello there, I'm Marian Ellis, and my company, Cape Insights, has made the seven part series of conversations with crackerjack speakers to give you a taste of things uniquely South African on a voyage of discovery that unpacks our creativity, diversity, heritage, and history. You'll hear from dream weavers and luminaries about what makes the country captivating and compelling. And on this visual journey that covers a variety of options from art to zebras, fossils to food foraging, colonization to creativity, you'll be shown aspects of South Africa's vibrant landscape, resilience, sociability, and breathtaking natural beauty that we hope will entice you to venture south and experience it for yourself. This is a learning journey. Join us as we all seek with new eyes. Welcome. So today, you'll be hearing about humankind's complex, incomplete, and highly contentious past. It can enlighten us as to who we are, and where we might be headed if we heed the markers. We'll be exploring big history, major events on the road of our cultural evolution to becoming human. We'll trace why South Africa can lay claim to being the cradle of life. We'll connect the concepts of fossil and the first people or first nation, the San who are one of the last hunter-gatherer societies on Earth. And we'll track where human origins began via revealing evidence and ancestral milestones in the cradle of humankind. So I thought some appropriate words to share, which come from our website on the itinerary of our archaeology tour, are these, and they were written some 1,800 years ago by Pliny. Out of Africa, always something new. So this is a learning journey for us all, and I've just learned the word Bamba, which means hello there in San, one of the dialects of San, and whom you'll be learning about as you listen on. So Bamba. Now, the first person we're going to be introducing you to is John Compton. So I'm going to tell you about our Cracker Jack speakers. John is an earth scientist with a PhD from Harvard and a passion for writing about the interconnectedness of our planet. We locals in Cape Town are grateful for his relocation to our shores and also the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Cape Town. He's published over 50 papers in scientific journals, written popular science books, and has been involved with several TV documentaries on the geology of Cape Town. His most recent book, Human Origins, provides a narrative of where and when and how our species evolved. It covers our deep, history, from the Big Bang to the present, with projections into the future and includes new perspectives based on the latest evidence from Southern Africa. So here he is to share some of his nuggets. John Compton. Thank you, Marian. Uh, I hope everyone can see and hear me. And it's a pleasure to be here. And greetings to everyone, wherever you might be. You might notice the map behind me is a map of Southern Africa. And if I could just have the first slide, I will get started. Right, so I'm going to very, very briefly touch upon some deep history and ask the question, is it possible that our species, Homo sapiens, originate on the southern coastal plain of South Africa? Many of you might be familiar with the fact that humans evolved in Africa, and many of you might associate that evolution with the East African Rift Valley. 
Um, but there's also a lot of new and exciting archaeological evidence coming out of Southern Africa. And in particular, the coastal regions of Southern Africa, where there's some exceptional preservation in cave sites that have really, I think, revolutionized our understanding, particularly of our species, the most recent uh, species within our lineage. And if you want to get to know more about this topic, then you can go to my website and you can uh, check out my book, Human Origins. But I'll try to give you a very brief, um, quick summary of what some of the ideas are. Okay, next. I'll start by saying that ours is a very complex history in terms of the evolution of our lineage. And this rather complex diagram just tries to show you that over the last six or seven million years, our species evolved through a long and very complex uh, ascent through various species. And the main point of this slide is to point out that human evolution really focuses on two major uh, aspects. The first is our going bipedal, on two, walking on two legs. And then from, a, from around three million years ago, an enlargement of our brain. And what this presentation will focus on is just that very top part, circled in red, of understanding perhaps how it is that our species came about uh, from earlier ancestors. So next. And if we look at Africa, it's a big continent. And as I mentioned, many of you would be familiar with the East African Rift Valley, where there's been a lot of abundant evidence of early uh, lineage evolution. And there's also been a lot of exciting evidence coming out of North Africa from the Maghreb. But in this talk, I wanna emphasize the third region of Africa that's very famous for its archeological record, and that's Southern Africa. And I'm gonna make two sort of major points. Um, and one is that one of the unique aspects of Southern Africa is its geographical isolation at the Southern tip of Africa. And I'll explain more about that in a moment. And secondly, that it appears to be the area in which uh, we first discovered seafood as a major and consistent part of our diet. Next. So if we look at the past, what this diagram tries to convey to you is that there were huge swings in climate. And you can see that in these ups and downs of this curve. And if you start at the far upper right hand side, that's today's climate, rather warm and wet and pleasant. And if you go back in time, what happens is you, you see that curve precipitously dropping down into colder, glacial conditions. And that's when we had woolly mammoths and huge ice sheets covering North America and Europe. And then in the past, it has gone warmer and colder and warmer and colder. And these cycles, these major climate cycles, had major impacts on not only the Northern Hemisphere, but also on Africa. And it's the time period in which we know that our species evolved particularly over the last million years or so from Homo erectus right up the way through to Homo sapiens. So if you go to the next slide, we'll see how the impact affected Africa. Africa during glacials was much drier and the environments were far more isolated and the groups of populations were maybe centered in the Ethiopian highlands around the East African lakes and around Southern Africa and North Africa. And then during glacial, interglacial periods like we experienced today when things warmer became warmer and wetter, those isolated groups could come out and intermingle before the next glacial period would happen and they'd be re-separated into these isolated groups. And the important thing about this is that it's through geographical isolation that speciation can occur. And that's because populations are isolated from intermingling and they can evolve separately from other groups. So let's see how that might have happened in the next slide. So the key thing about Southern Africa is that it has these extensive coastal plains, both the Western and Southern. Those are the green areas. 
And they're surrounded by a very rugged mountain chain called the Cape Fold Belt. Beautiful mountains, but very rugged. And these mountains can effectively provide a barrier to animal and human movement. And what you can also notice on this slide is that offshore on the sh what we call the shelf, it's relatively shallow water. And during glacial periods, all the seawater that went into making the ice resulted in a lowering of sea level by 120, 130 meters. And what that did was it greatly expanded the coastal plain. So through those glacial cycles that I showed you, you had this expansion, then contraction, expansion, and then contraction of the coastal plain. And that's important because it was times when people were isolated and then not isolated. And if we look at the other distinctive property of the South Coast, the next slide, we'll see that the other key feature was in terms of driving that evolution towards a bigger brain, which I mentioned earlier. And essentially what you see here at the top is the skull of Homo erectus uh, from about a million years ago in the skull of our species, Homo sapiens. And you can see this dramatic inflation ballooning of our skull. And that of course was to accommodate a much bigger brain. And a much bigger brain, as we like to imagine, was important because it was important. It allowed us to take on new behaviors. It allowed us to make different tools. It allowed us greater access to food and resources, which allowed in turn for this bigger brain to be supported. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see, well, what was one of the key behavioral changes? And what that one of the key ones was the adaptation of eating seafood. So here we see a picture of Pinnacle Point Cave um, near Muscle Bay, uh, it has an exceptional record that includes the 164,000 year old deposits of the brown mussel, Perina perina, and also the small um, barnacle shell that's exclusively grows on the southern right well. And this is evidence that our ancestors at that time were collecting these marine resources and eating them. And these were incredibly good for them nutritionally wise and for growing a big brain. So next slide. And it's through growing a big brain that we see a whole array of what were the beginnings or the earliest evidence of modern human behaviors that we associate with modern humans. And we certainly had some of these in the North Africa and the Maghreb sites. We had them in East Africa as well. But South Africa stands out exceptionally well in terms of some of the earliest evidence. As I mentioned, if we follow that from the left-hand side towards the right-hand side, that's 200,000 years of history. And as I mentioned, about 160 is the earliest evidence for a seafood diet. That was fairly coincident with the use of fire to make better stone tools through something called pyrotechnology. There's evidence that people collected shells, keepsake shells for their beauty alone. There's also evidence that they collected red ochre and used toolkits to make uh, powdered ochre for uh, symbolism. They engraved uh, ochre as well. They engraved ostrich eggshell. They make microlithic stone tools to make bow and arrow, such that by 60, 70,000 years ago, uh, it appears that the modern day hunter gatherer, who we today see in some preserved preserve, uh, populations like the San in Southern Africa, existed by this time. And if we look at the next slide, the insignificance of that is from Southern Africa, then those groups with this uh, cultural heritage already, stone tools, symbolism, etc were able to expand and they expanded first into Af throughout Africa. And when the desert barrier of the Sahara uh, lightened up or was released, they were able to get out of Africa. And from there, they very rapidly spread throughout the world in something that's known as the great expansion. And the world then became populated with our species, Homo sapiens and all the other cousins of ours, Neanderthals, Denisovans, um, so forth, they all became extinct. And so we are the last remaining in our lineage and we have very successfully 
through our big brains, taken over the world, uh, and so forth. So on the final slide, I'll just finish off by pointing out again, there's my website if you want to learn more, johnascompton.com, uh, the book Human Origins, which is available, uh, and also um, a previous book of mine on the rocks and mountains of Cape Town, if you're interested in the geolo local geology. And then finally, later this year or early next year, I have another book coming out called West Coast, A Natural History, which focuses on many aspects of the natural history of the West Coast. And I'll finish there and take questions. John. I hope I didn't go too long. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I have a comment which generally applies, which comes from Vancouver Island saying, hi, greetings here in North America. We need to visit a cradle of civilization today in this historic week. That's a general comment. However, there is a specific question. And it is, if a seafood diet was so critical in our evolution, why did it take so long to be discovered? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it seems sort of um, obvious for anyone who lives near the coast that going down and harvesting mussels and collecting various sea life at the seashore is a relatively easy thing to do. Um, and it's an interesting question why it wasn't discovered uh, sooner than it was. Um, and I guess in part that's perhaps explained by the fact that <clears throat> although many of us love to go to the beach today so for holiday and so forth, beaches are not particularly suitable for humans in the sense that we need a good supply of fresh water. And it's difficult if we're uh, broadly exposed, like on a beach. So I suspect that for starters, a lot of early ancestors did not hang out at the beach normally. And if they did, it might have taken a bit of courageousness to first eat seafood. It's a bit like uh, Jonathan Swift's quote, he was a brave man who first ate an oyster. <laughs> so I don't know, it was probably some combination of factors. But what's clear is that once a marine diet was adapted, it was incredibly beneficial because it had so many health benefits, particularly for pregnant women and, and young infants with very rapidly growing brains and many needs for the sort of things that seafood can provide and relatively easy and accessible for them to collect. So it was a, I think it was a huge turning point in terms of um, evolution and the importance of diet. Mm. Uh, as they say, you are what you eat, supposedly, so. Okay, thank you for that. And then I have one more. Okay, I recently heard that Fossils of our species date back even older in Morocco. Um, does that mean it was there rather than Southern Africa that our species first emerged? The Maghreb versus us, I guess. Right, the Northern tip versus the Southern tip. Yeah. And that's, that's also interesting because if you look at the archeological record, Southern Africa has an amazingly preserved record over the last, uh, that critical period, the last 100, 150,000 years. And so does the Maghreb, so does North Africa. And it, what appears clear is that both areas were um, isolated. It's not difficult to see that with the Maghreb because you had the Sahara Desert there and you had the Mediterranean Sea and they didn't, people didn't have boats yet. So people were effectively isolated at that northern tip of Africa. And that's where we see a lot of additional evidence for um, human innovations and, and evidence that people were evolving there. But the fossils found there that are attributed to Homo sapiens, I think some archeologists would argue are not uh, strictly speaking our species, Homo sapiens, but maybe represent the precursor uh, to us. And so although they've been uh, dated to around 300,000 years ago uh, and would make them the oldest, um, I believe, and I think others would agree, some would probably disagree with me, but that it's, it's not quite Homo sapiens yet at that stage. So uh, although there was a lot of innovation in the Northern tip as well as the Southern tip, all the innovations so far dated accurately 
show that they first appear in the southern tip of Africa, not the northern tip, and that those fossils that dated earlier, I believe, are of a predecessor species. Yeah, thank you. Now this, you know, that sort of, well, I love that answer. So <laughs> being all proudly, yeah. Um, thank you so much for that. And I am going to try and be a worthy, focused timekeeper. So I'm going to say thank you, John Compton, Emeritus Professor at the University of Cape Town and say, hello, John Parkinson, Emeritus Professor of Archaeology. Um, okay, so about John Parkinson, our second Crackerjack speaker. After John's early years at Cambridge and a PhD thesis entitled, Follow the San, it does follow that his lifelong research interest in Southern Africa has been in hunters and gatherers. He's an emeritus professor of archeology span and a fellow of the University of Cape Town. And he has a distinguished research which has been is directed at understanding patterns of cultural variation and evolution of hunter gatherer settlements. So this has involved mapping, sampling and excavation of sites across the landscape to reconstruct life histories and social relations, settlement choices, image making and resource use by our ancestors. From engraved ostrich eggshells and bone tools to shell beads and the first evidence of drawing you'll hear about some of our humanity's earliest use of symbols, art, technological innovation, to say nothing of branding. So, Professor Parkinson, who is going to begin his presentation with a four minute, four odd minute uh, video, and then he's going to tell us about an excavation site, which um, epitomizes his work. So, John Parkinson. Well, Diplif is one of half a dozen, ten sites that have a long depositional sequence that covers a very particularly special time in the history of people. The time when our species emerged, the time when some of the behaviors that we associate with our species emerged, and the time when somehow uh, those modern people with those innovative behaviors uh, moved out of Africa into uh, Europe and Asia. We chose the site because it's halfway between the mountains and the coast, and we were interested in people's movements around the Western Cape, between the coast and the interior. And we dug quite, a, quite an extensive part of the upper deposits here. And we've got very nice preservation of bedding materials, fireplaces, artifacts of stone, but also artifacts out of wood and bone and so on. The surprise was that very close to the surface, we got down into something that we could see immediately was much older, 30, 40, 50,000 years old. What we have here is a whole series of superimposed visits. So we have the last 2,000 years, which is the period when pastoralists were coming in and competing in some ways with the hunter-gatherers for local resources. We've got that story here, and then below it, we've got the story of early modern people and what they were doing, what they were making, what they were eating, how they were living. The, one of the biggest and most surprising finds was that in the lower deposits, which we knew by then to be quite old, more than 30,000 years, we were finding pieces of ostrich eggshell which very clearly had been marked. They'd been scored with patterned lines, sometimes parallel lines, sometimes lines at an acute angle, sometimes cross-hatching. And we were also finding pieces of um, the openings of ostrich eggshell water flasks, 
putting this together, we knew that more than 30,000 years ago, people were making ostrich eggshell water flasks, which is a practice that carried on right till the present day, of course. But more than that, they were marking them. That's my egg. Or that's the way we mark our eggs, not the way they mark their whatever it is. And of course, it's those intangibles of whether that's a personal marking system or a group marking system. You can't dig that up. By then we knew that they were not just more than 30,000 years old, but they were somewhere between 60 and 70,000 years old. So I, I, I think that's what Deep Kloof is best known for uh, in the archaeological world and in our understanding of the emergence of modern humans and modern human behavior. But there are also other aspects. There's a lot of ochre in the, in, the, in the deep kloof sequence. And we now know that right through that period from 40,000 to 150,000 years ago, people were using a lot of ochre. They were either making paint or they were using ochre for something else. But there are other things that are happening in deep kloof and other places. And that is the heating of stone to make it more flakeable. And the mixing of substances, substances to make mastic. In other words, to allow you to glue a stone tip into a wooden or other uh, handle. So there are a range of these. This is what people refer to often as complex behaviors, which apparently are emerging in the, in the time period between about 150 and 40,000 years ago. And they are taken by archaeologists as evidence of an increasing cognitive capacity, an increasing understanding of materials and how they can be modified and used. So in that sense, we're regarding these time periods at Deep Kloof as the emergence of something that subsequently became widespread, if not universal, amongst hunter-gatherers. And now, John, in real life, the person who will be speaking to us further about Deep Kloof. Thank you. Thanks, Marion. Uh, thanks for the invite to talk. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Deep Kloof, which is the cave that I was standing in there. I'm going to show you some of the excavations there and some of the things that we found there. Could I have the first slide? So on the right there, you've got the slope up to uh, Deep Kloof. Uh, there are actually two caves in that rocky hill there. Um, the one on the right is what we call Deep Kloof Rock Shelter. The one on the left uh, is, is not quite as big, um, but it also has a very interesting deposit. Um, these two caves and this little hill here are about 16 or 17 kilometers up the Fleurin Flay from Elands Bay Cave and from the mouth of the Flay at, at Elands Bay. Um, it's really interesting because they actually have quite a different depositional sequence to Elands Bay Cave. So you might be looking at, at rock shelters that are quite close together, but they can be telling you quite different parts of the human story. And that's why archaeologists have to dig lots of sites. You, you don't get the whole answer in one place. Uh, you, have to, you have to piece it together. It's kind of like a giant three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. So next one, please. I think the next uh, slide shows the excavation. Cedric Pockenpool, that's Cedric there, just, just behind the red box uh, excavating. Cedric and I started digging there in 1973. We dug again in the 80s. And then from 1999 to 2013, we had a long excavation at Deep Kloof with our French colleagues. That's uh, Jean-Philippe Rigaud there uh, squatting and uh, Piaget Texier, uh, Guillaume Perez, and we had a really nice collaborative uh, excavation there, which produced most of the interesting things that I'm going to talk about now. We actually, we like most archaeologists, we gridded the site so that we could keep, keep a kind of control on what we were finding and where it was. We dug that, that hat on the left there, that shaded area is the area of our excavation. We had to dig extensively across the site because you don't find, in, in the same way as I've just been saying, you don't find the same story in every cave. You don't find the same story in every part of every cave. And so you have to 
you, you, have, you have to spread your excavation out so that you make sure you get the whole story from the site. And what you're looking at the, at the excavation there. Next, please. Now, close up on Cedric. Cedric's uh, removing charcoal from a fireplace. Now, the deposits here, as I said in that little interview in the cave, are very episodic. And that turns out to be quite characteristic of most cave sites, not only in Southern Africa, but across the world. People don't come, hunter-gatherers don't come to a place and live there for long periods of time. And they may in fact not come back to some of these places for several tens of years, several hundreds of years, even several thousands of years. There's a veneer of occupation in this cave that's about 2,000 years old. Got a very nice story there of the appearance of pastoralists in the area and the interrelations between pastoralists and hunter-gatherers. And that's, that's all sandwiched in the last 2,000 years. And then apparently before that, nobody came to this place for 40,000 years. And un immediately underneath, uh, uh, just near to Cedric's head then, where you can see those beautiful fireplaces and hearths, very nicely stratified there. That's all beyond the range of radiocarbon dating. It's all more than 40,000 years old. And then from 40,000 back to about 120,000, there's a very nice sequence, a very nice story. Uh, and that's, that's particularly uh, attractive to us because uh, as John was saying just now, this is the period uh, when modern people emerged, when people started developing very innovative, quite new kinds of behavior. And you can find it in the form of artifacts and bones and other remains in association with those fireplaces there. Now, so Cedric's taking charcoal out of that little hearth there that he's digging, not in order to get a radiocarbon date because you couldn't, it's, it's, th th that charcoal is too old to be radiocarbon dating. He's actually taking it out so that we could find out what kinds of wood people are using to make their fires from. So the whole sequence is full of organic material. It's full of charcoal. It's, full of, it's got quite a lot of shell in it. Even though this cave is 17 kilometers from the shoreline, there are marine shells there. Uh, in fact, there are uh, whale barnacles of exactly the kind that John just showed. Uh, and there's a lot of animal bone. Um, so we've got a good idea what people were eating uh, and we can, and we can um, associate that with the kinds of stone artifacts that they were making. Next, please. So in order to date these, uh, these layers, which are beyond the range of radiocarbon dating, we have to use uh, uh, optically stimulated luminescence. And that's, uh, that's Anne Wintle kneeling uh, on the right and Zenobia Jacobs, and they, they have, a couple, they have a couple of techniques that they use to try and date the age of the sediments. One of the French team is also a, um, a, a luminescence dating lady, and she, that's Chantal Trebola. She, she dates um, pieces of heated stone. So if, if pieces of sulcrete or quartzite have been near a fireplace and they've heated up, when, they, when they're heating up, the, their, um, the, the crystalline structure is such that the, the age, if you like, of those crystals is set to naught. And gradually, uh, once they're buried again, mm -hmm. they start to tick over like a little clock in, uh, in the deposit. So that's how we know that these sediments are 40 to 120,000 years old. Next, please. Not actually got to the bottom yet of the cave. Um, and so there may, be, there may be some more deposit below that. I suppose that there are a lot of these interesting, innovative behaviors that are coming out of Blombos Cave, Pinnacle Point Cave, Sibudu up there in Natal, Classes River Mouth, Ace Fontaine. These are the six or 10 sites that I was mentioning earlier that are contributing to this picture of the emergence of modern people. The real contribution of Deep Kloof are these uh, marked pieces of ostrich eggshell. These are quite small pieces because all the flasks, all the water flasks, have broken and what we're finding are small pieces like these ones with these parallel uh, scored lines on them. Next, please. Um, and, and we know that they're water flasks because we find the circular uh, perforations that people have made in the, in the, in the flask 
so that they can get the water in and then they'll bung it up with something so that they can store it. These are some of the earliest storage and transport objects uh, that anybody's found anywhere in the world. Th this is the origin of, of the dam. The Clan William Dam in the neighborhood here is a water storage uh, artifact, if you like. Well, these are very early water storage and transport artifacts. The, the, the object right at the top uh, there has some beautiful little scored lines coming away from the circular perforation at the top. So that we know that that's what they are. And these are the kinds of water storage transport uh, objects that uh, people in the Kalahari are still making, of course. Next, please. Now, along with perforated shells, which uh, we find uh, from Blombos at the top left, or pieces of ochre with scoring marks on, these are a whole set of uh, innovations um, that, are, that are happening at the same time. And as I say, we, we build up this series of innovations by digging a series of sites. And it, it does correspond with the first appearance of, um, of intensive, if you like, as John was saying, marine food consumption. People are not only gathering shellfish, but they are collecting carcasses of seals and penguins and other birds there. And they're consuming a lot of seafood, which has got a lot of fatty acid in and is very good for your brain. Next, please. So, yes, I mean, what we've got, as John was saying, is we've, we've, we've got something that's quite unique down here. Um, uh, the only, the only similar occurrence, I suppose, is the other Mediterranean part of Africa, the real Mediterranean, if you like, uh, where, where something similar, I think there are some differences between what's happening in North Africa and what's happening in South Africa. But this is clearly, down here along the coast, clearly very important and significant part of the world. Was it the Garden of Eden? Well, I don't think it was a garden. I think it was a shoreline. And I don't think it was an apple that Eve was giving to Adam. It was a limpet, and I think I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joan Parkinson. I have a question from Luigi, who's in the Cape, and he said, here's a tough one, John. From a political point of view, which stage of sapiens can lay claim to the Western Cape? A brief answer. Well, uh, San, San hunter-gatherers were, were all over Southern Africa. Two and a half thousand years ago, the only people in Southern Africa, south of the Zambezi, were San people. They were hunter-gatherers, and it was only after 2,000 years ago that, first of all, um, Bantu-language-speaking people started to move into the eastern side of Southern Africa, and pastoralists started to move into the western side. And those pastoralists were very closely related to the sand. They were probably people who had sheep and cattle, which they got from Bantu language speaking people further to the north and east. And uh, because they didn't have any domestic plants to worry about, they were able to, 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 to move down the western side of Southern Africa. Whereas the Bantu speaking, Bantu language speaking people were moving down the eastern side because they had they were planting crops as well as uh, herding domestic animals, and they need the better. They needed the better soils of the eastern side. So everybody, two and a half thousand years ago, was um, a, 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 an ancestor of the modern San communities, and gradually those San communities were restricted to particular parts of southern Africa. There was a lot of terrible genocide, and we now have uh, very residual populations. Uh, of, of, of sand groups. There is and it seems that out of this area, uh, from those very early hunter-gatherers, um, uh, 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 modern people spread first across and around Africa and then out of Africa. John, thank you. There is one more question from Dick, but I'm afraid I'm going to, well, I'm afraid I'm not going to put it to you, but I am going to get it answered, Dick in due course. So we're going to move on, and thank you, John, to Howard Geach. Now, Howard has a perfect combination of skills to guide us around the cradle of humankind. 
apart from resembling Indiana Jones when you meet him up there, um, he's a mining engineer. And since he is, he'll definitively tell us about what's below the ground in this extraordinary World Heritage Site with years of experience in the bush via his Wilderness Leadership School and Conservation Corporation experience. He's also deeply knowledgeable as a game ranger. And he'll be able to tell us about all that lives on top of the ground, the plants, the animals and the birds. And I think any minute now, Terry is going to change the slide from John Parkinson to Howard Geach. Um, Howard Geach, his uh, specialized tour company works in conjunction with Professor Lee Berger of Witts University and offers exclusive paleo safaris that take you to private sites within the cradle, which is one of the world's most important prehistoric treasure troves because of its 12 major fossil sites and groundbreaking discoveries. So tonight we're going to give you a taste of one of his tours. Um, and it's Bamba Howard. And I'm not sure what's happening with our technical team. Ah, there we have our own Indiana Jones, Howard Geach. Hello, everyone. My name is Howard Geach, and I'm going to be your guide on the Malapa Human Origins Tour today. And we are going to traverse the core of the cradle of humankind, which was inscribed by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site in 1999. Our tour departs from the Cradle Restaurant and we head up into the ridges of an 8,000 hectare core area of the Cradle of Humankind, a remarkably beautiful area given that it is literally on Johannesburg's doorstep. First to the viewpoint where to the east of us is the oldest continental craton in existence. To the south of us, the biggest deposit of gold in the world, and to the north of us, the biggest deposit of platinum in the world, and sandwiched in between the biggest repository of hominin fossils in the world. As Vincent Carruthers points out in his book, nowhere else in the world, and in such a relatively compact space, can one see all of the elements required to sustain complex life on Earth. In short, it is a remarkably diverse and intriguing place. From the viewpoint, we then drive out to a sinkhole, sinkholes known as death traps and bone collectors. It is here that the bones and skeletons of animals and hominins, our ancestors, are kept safe away from the erosional horizon. En route, we pass a ridge which has evidence of early Stone Age, Middle Stone Age, Late Stone Age, Iron Age and Boer War fortifications all piled on top of each other. We just have to unscramble it. This is a relatively young sinkhole, only about 15 years old. But as you can imagine, anything that falls in here is taken underground and is kept in inverted commas safely away from the surface and then gets hardened into breccia for later excavation. This is dolomite. You can see the layer upon layer upon layer, hundreds of millions of years of bacterial mats that photosynthesized and produced the oxygen that you and I breathe to this very day. It is in this dolomite, prone to erosion, that the caves form drop down off the high grassy ridges into the beautiful Gladysvale Valley. It is amazing to think that such wild landscapes lie barely 35 kilometers from Johannesburg, a truly wild and wonderful place. It was the lime miners that first discovered the hominin fossils, starting in 1924 with the Buxton Lime Quarry and subsequently across the cradle of humankind. This in picture is a lime kiln from Gladysvale where they created the quick lime for sale. Gladysvale cave is an extremely rich fossil bearing cave and this block of breccia from inside the cave 
shows just how full of fossils it is and how they are protected by the breccia that forms inside the cave. We're probably looking at bones here of roughly two million years old. One of my visits to Gladysvale, I was fortunate enough to bump into Professor Lee Berger and Professor John Hawkes on the Gladysvale external excavation um, as they were busy discussing some of the technical aspects of the external excavation. This well is important because it contains within it sediments spanning sub three million years, which helps to cross date other digs within the cradle of humankind. Off to my right is where Dr. Lucinda Backwell found a fossilized hyena coprolite containing probable human hair. That probable human hair is important because it places either modern Homo sapiens or Homo sapiens antecessors in this site between 170,000 and 225,000 years ago. From Gladysvale, we then proceed over the grassland ridges to Malapa, where Australopithecus sediba was discovered in 2008. And it is the most advanced of the Australopiths yet discovered. We are at Malapa, the multi-award winning Malapa observation deck, known affectionately as the Beetle which protects and acts as a working platform and an observation deck for the Malapa dig site beneath it. Malapa is actually a cave remnant and excavation is extremely slow. Each grid in sequence is taken down 10 centimeters at a time and then sieved and checked. Valuable artifacts are then bagged and tagged and are sent back to the university for analysis. Back in the lab, work is equally painstaking. Here, Professor Berger watches a preparator carefully, carefully revealing Australopithecus sediba as he removes the breccia from around the actual mandible. Hello. Here are the results. On the left is Homo naledi from the Rising Star Cave system. On the right, is MH1, Australopithecus sediba, which was excavated from the Malapa dig. Sediba is just under 2 million years old. Well, folks, that's a four-hour tour covered in six minutes and 40 seconds. Guests after the tour can always relax and refresh themselves at the beautiful Cradle Restaurant with stunning views northwards out Oh. Thank you. And now, for the last few minutes that we have together, I'm going to be putting a question to the same question to all three of our speakers. And the question arose from this quote behind was saying by Marcel Proust, a real voyage of discovery consists not only in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And in Proust's time, in the late 1800s, this became a parlor game and it was very popular because it was believed that if you asked a Proust style question, um, the individual responding would reveal his or her true nature. So I'm going to begin with John Compton in the order of the speaking. Um, John, what is a quote that lingers in your scientific marine geologist heart? Well, Marianne, I guess the quote I, I've always liked, it's a very simple one, and that is, and is all life is one. And uh, Bill Bryson made, I don't know if he's the originator of that, but he made it popular in his book. Yeah. And I just think it's a very profound statement. And it basically tells us or conveys that we are all related to all of the life forms on earth. And from the various simple earliest unicellular organisms that are in the, um, you know, Bushveld country from 3.5 billion years ago, right the way up through to modern day, 
Um, it's an amazing thing that life evolved on Earth in the first place. And what's also amazing is that all of these life forms share, share a common origin. Mm. And I think that's very profound. Indeed. Thank you. Professor Parkinson, what yes. has inspired you um, or something that you hold close to your heart, inspirationally? Okay, I, well, I been studying hunter-gatherers for 40 or 50 years, mostly in Southern Africa. Uh, but because archaeologically you can't actually talk to those hunter-gatherers, you can only look for the traces of their behavior and I suppose occasionally the traces of themselves. Uh, but because, because I really want to know the long-term history of hunting and gathering in Southern Africa, I've spent quite a lot of my time looking at living hunter-gatherers. And what I've learned over that time is just how amazingly sensible they were. Hunter-gatherers in Southern Africa have a, a shocking uh, press. They've been very, very badly caricatured. And if you read early traveler accounts of hunter-gatherers, um, they, those are awful caricatures. But actually, when you look at hunter-gatherers, they are the most sensible people you'll ever meet and they are very respectful. They don't own resources on the landscape. They are stewards of those resources. Mm -hmm. That means that they look after them. And if you read the stories that we have from the 19th century from these hunter-gatherers about how they uh, see the world and the stories they tell about themselves and about the world, it's quite amazing uh, because they are not separate from the world. They are part of the world. They have to sing the seasons into existence. Mm -hmm. They have to participate in the continuation of the landscape and the seasonal cycling of resources and so on. That means they look after them. Mm -hmm. We don't look after them because we see ourselves separate. And so I suppose what, I've, what I, I, I would never have said this to you in 1972 when I was, you know, when I was a, a young man starting to do archeology, span but as I, you know, as, I, as I looked at more and more archeological sites and thought more and more about how, how archeologists were practicing in the world, it became very obvious to me that I should be an archeologist, I should be a hunter gatherer. If I come back, I wanna be a hunter gatherer. Okay, so, so that's for reincarnation and a bit of a combination of we are all one. Thank you, John Parkinson. Okay, Monsieur Geach in the Cradle of Humankind. Yes, what well, I've always, I've always rather liked Mark Twain. And um, one of his quotes is that travel is fatal for prejudice, bigotry, and narrow mindedness. In <laughs> yeah, as we say here, viva that. Right, and you take people around there and we take people around here. Um, yeah, indeed. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your Thanks, participation. Bird. So in our next session, you're going to hear about the buzzing big city culture and crowd pulling events in Johannesburg particularly and Pretoria. And you're going to see how creativity and cultures flourish in diverse urban and rural landscapes. Because in the far north of the country that borders Zimbabwe and Botswana is the Limpopo province. And you'll meet talented and vibrant artisans in these landscapes, these rural landscapes. Um, you'll be hearing from Marcella Echavaria, who's a global lifestyle specialist who builds bridges between cultures and people. And she integrates sustainability with profitability. Lucy McGarry is one of four women founders of Latitudes, which is a pioneering art fair in Johannesburg. And then you've got a duo of Annika, Janneke and Gert Rebergen, who are social development entrepreneurs whose feet are in the Netherlands, but whose hearts are in South Africa. 
You've just had a glimpse of aspects of South African landscapes and heard from some local personalities of note. And there are more, all thought-provoking, stimulating, eye-catching. So please join us on our other learning journeys. If you venture south, or better still, when you venture south, you'll get more than a taste of our delectable food and our award-winning wines. We'll show you over a variety of our landscapes on one of our small group tours designed for curious travelers that delve deeply into the same niches you're seeing in the series. These are a mere taster, just so you know. We thought an appropriate way to end would be to share a salutation in Kosa, which is one of our 11 official languages, and it means go well or stay well. So with our thanks and good wishes, Hamba Gashlet.